I'd like you each to think of somebody who you know really well, someone close to you who you see frequently. Now imagine that person walking in this room. But wait, you don't recognize them. You can't remember who they are. This is an example of what somebody with severe dementia may be experiencing. The most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. There's about 100 of us in this room. Statistically, about three of us will have Alzheimer's disease by the age of 75. This isn't terrible odds. But by the age of 85, this increases to 17 of us. And if we're also fortunate to live long beyond the age of 85, one in three of us would have Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, there's currently no cure, that there's no drug that any of us can take to prevent the disease, or to slow or stop the progression if we were to get it. And because the elderly population is growing worldwide, the number of Alzheimer's cases is expected to also increase. And with this, the economical and societal costs are projected to also increase. Last year, the worldwide uh, costs were around $1 trillion that were associated with Alzheimer's disease. And this is projected to double by 2030. To put this in perspective of what $2 trillion is, that would be enough for every person living in Belgium to buy a new house every year. And so this is clearly a devastating disease for the individuals with Alzheimer's, for their caregivers and loved ones, and also for society. So it's critical that we find a treatment for this disease. And for that, we need scientific research. So let's dive into the science of Alzheimer's disease. So if you look at an at a Alzheimer's disease brain compared to a healthy brain, you can see this loss of brain mass. If you look microscopically at the brain, what you'll see is dying brain cells, or neurons, and then two abnormal deposits in the brain, intracellular tangles and extracellular plaques. Now, scientists have found that these plaques are composed primarily of what's called the amyloid beta peptide. And we have known now for 30 years that this amyloid beta peptide is actually derived from a larger protein that sits on the surface of a cell. And there are enzymes that act as scissors in the brain that cut the amyloid precursor protein. The first cut leads to secretion of this large extracellular region of APP, termed SAPP. And it's the second cut that leads to production of the A-beta peptide. So current therapeutic strategies have been aimed at either clearing away this A-beta or by reducing its production by inhibiting these scissors. However, as you may have heard in the news over the last several months and years, so far, none of these treatments have, have been successful in clinical trials. And so while I think it's important uh, not to give up on those strategies and to continue to try to improve them, I think we also have to think of new ideas, new strategies, and new drug targets. And I think for this, we need to better answer key fundamental basic questions about Alzheimer's disease. And one of these questions that has remained unanswered for decades is, well, what is the amyloid precursor protein normally doing in the brain? And today I want to give you a glimpse how I, along with a team of researchers, answered this question. So what we and others have shown is that it seems to be this SAPP part of the protein that really mediates most of the function of APP. So for example, we took neurons from the brains of mice and we grew them in a dish we can then record their electrical activity with an electrode. And these spikes that you see here represent an, an event where two neurons are talking to one another. So we record the frequency of these events at baseline, and then we added our SAPP protein. And we find that this decreases the communication events between the two neurons. So what this tells us is that SAPP acting outside of the cell somehow inhibits the release of neurotransmitters inside the first cell, which these neurotransmitters act to relay a signal to the next cell, and that's how they communicate. And so we hypothesized 
that then there must be some receptor at the surface in order for SAPP to act on inhibiting neurotransmitter release. So we thought understanding what this receptor is would help us understand what APP is doing in the brain. So we looked for this receptor, essentially by going fishing. So what's the first thing you need to go fishing? You need your fishing pole to physically pull out the fish, and you need your bait to attract the fish. For our fishing pole, we used beads, and for our bait, we used our SAPP protein that was hooked to these beads. And then you need your fish. For our fish, we used synaptic proteins that were extracted from the brains of mice. And we went fishing lots of times, and we kept catching the same fish. And that fish was the GABA-B receptor. So what's the GABA-B receptor? Well, it looks like this. It has two different subunits. This first subunit is what binds an inhibitory neurotransmitter called GABA. And the second subunit is what relays the signal into, inside the cell. And then there are two different forms of the first subunit which only differ in that there are these two sushi domains in the A form. So you might be thinking how appropriate we found a protein with sushi domains after we went fishing. So I wanted to know which of these subunits were, were binding to SAPP. So I expressed each of these uh, GABA B subunits into cells that are labeled in green. And then I added the SAPP labeled in red. And when I wash away the SAPP, if the cells were still labeled in red, this means that the SAPP was binding to that subunit. And so what you can see is we found that SAPP specifically bound to the 1A subunit, which has these two sushi domains. And in further experiments, we, we further narrowed down these interacting domains to the first sushi domain and to a small region within APP. And we found that even just isolating these two fragments, that they could still bind. And so we could use these as tools. And so we first wanted to find what is the, the structure of this interaction. So we first did experiments just with the sushi one peptide alone. And this is what we saw. We found nothing, absolutely nothing. But then when we added our SAPP protein, uh, the small peptide that bound, along with the sushi one domain, this is what we found. So this tells us a couple things. First of all, it tells us how these two proteins fit together, which would be important for designing drugs. It also tells us that upon binding, SAPP causes an actual physical change in the GABA-B receptor to go from a normally unstructured uh, domain to, to the structure that you see here. So we are convinced now that they physically bind. But do they, does GABA-B receptor mediate the function of SAPP? So for this, we went back to our neurons in a dish where we found that SAPP reduced the neuronal communication between the neurons. And when we added our small peptide that bound, we see a similar effect. So suggesting it's through the GABA-B receptor. But to really show this, we then blocked the GABA-B receptor with a drug and found that then SAPP could have no effect. So this shows that SAPP is acting via the GABA-B receptor. But these are in neurons in a dish. What about in a brain? So then we looked in a mouse brain that, was, that were anesthetized and that were genetically engineered to express a protein that would flash under a microscope whenever the cell was firing. And so that's what you see here. And after we added our peptide, we found that also in a brain, it reduced the firing of neurons. So we think we finally understand what APP is doing in the brain. This first fragment that is cut from APP binds to a specific form of the GABA-B receptor, the 1A form, and this leads to an inhibition of synaptic uh, release of neurotransmitters, and thereby regulating neuronal communication. And this regulating, regulation of neuronal communication could be important for how networks work normally in the brain. So that's what we know today from these studies. But it's findings like these that can transform tomorrow. Because it leads us to new ideas, new potential strategies. So for instance, what I plan to do now 
is go back to the Alzheimer's disease situation and try to understand better how SAPP levels are changed to determine if GABA B receptor activity is affected and to see if this newly identified uh, function of APP might underlie some of the network changes uh, that we see in the brain of Alzheimer's. And the implications may actually go beyond Alzheimer's disease because this GABA B receptor has been shown to be involved in a number of diseases such as schizophrenia and addiction. And it's been proposed that if we could modulate a specific form of that GABA B receptor, that this could be advantageous therapeutically. And so we, for the first time, can modulate specifically the A isoform and with even just a small peptide. So how are we going to transform the outlook of Alzheimer's disease? Well, in the discovery I just showed you, I did not do this alone. It was with a team of scientists, a large team working together, combining their expertise from institutions within Belgium and from around the world. But it's not just scientists that were responsible for this discovery. And it's not just scientists that are going to solve Alzheimer's. There's another very important component, and that's you. You may wonder what you can do. Well, one thing is you can support private foundations that fund Alzheimer's research. I'm very grateful that my work has been funded by the Alzheimer's Association and also the Belgium Foundation for Alzheimer's Research, and, and by um, donating to them and being involved in their fundraising activities. There's also another second very important thing you can do, and that's advocate for Alzheimer's research to the politicians, your representatives, that determine how uh, taxpayer money is being spent. And tell them that, that Alzheimer's research is important to you. So for example, uh, my, among my collaborators, we received uh, funding from, from government-funded agencies such as these. But it's going to take all of us working together scientists with other scientists, but also with, with you and with the government to solve this devastating disease. And I hope that a small glimpse into my research may have convinced you that even understanding basic fundamental questions about how the brain works, how proteins that are involved in Alzheimer's disease may normally be functioning in the brain, the understanding these today may tomorrow then lead to new ideas and new, new strategies for Alzheimer's treatment. And I think this is what it's going to take to together change, transform the outlook of Alzheimer's disease.